I think those of us who are residents at Moore State University are introducing ourselves uh, at the various sessions. So uh, I will do that. I am Joyce Lester, Associate Professor of English at Moorhead State University. I will today confine my discussion to the doll maker. You notice on the program that it does speak of sense of place in Jesse Stewart and in Harriet Arno as the doll maker. That's an extremely broad subject. And uh, since we do have uh, limited time, about 30 minutes uh, for each of us, uh, then I will confine those comments to the doll maker. So if there are those of you who came to hear about Jesse Stewart <coughs> and don't want to hear about Harriet Arno as the doll maker, please feel free to to leave. I have found that there are some uh, departure points in um, Harriet Arnaud's sense of place that do apply to Jesse Stewart as well, however. Although there are a number of renowned regionalist writers in American letters, few are as closely tied to their regions as is the Kentucky author Harriet Arnaud, author of the trilogy Mountain Path, 1936, Hunter's Horn, 1949, and The Dollmaker, 1954. Arnaud's sense of place is a principal thematic and technical concept in her trilogy, but especially so in the powerful finale, The Dollmaker. Sense of place, so important to literary culture, is expressed in The Dollmaker in at least three ways. One, through dynamics of lived in a particular environment, rather than only through self with emphasis on the Southern Hill Country vision and quality of relationships as contrasted with the Metro wartime culture. Two, through religion, with the paradox of where the true religion lies, as the quest for spiritual answers is a consuming <coughs> and vibrant force to estranged environs. And three, through description and dialogue, couched in language, which communicates a sense of place that appears to derive from an extensive and deeply felt attachment to it. The doll maker makes a certain and determined statement that a sense of place is much more than a mere literary setting, that the implications of place are metaphysical and are unquestionably sound. Rene de Beau says that, quote, the catalyst that converts a physical locality into a place is the process of engaging with it in a symbolic relationship." Unquote. Family tradition, the work ethic, and other cultural values are left behind as our nose raw-boned female protagonist is transported from Baloo, Kentucky to Detroit. Both thematically and technically, the novel responds to milieu it suggests that locale determines human effectiveness and often determines circumstances as well. The dynamics of life in Arno's Appalachia center around the land and the past. These reference points help create and sustain a sense of place. In Arno's cultural depictions, these are controlling thematic elements which also serve technically to move the plot along. Mountain people especially seem to have a deep compatibility with the land and the past to the point that they feel a deep and complete identity with both. The connection between human beings and their milieu is sometimes so strong that people lose their identity or even die when separated from their place. Loss of identity affects Gertie Neville's Arnaud's daughter. Structurally, the novel is a lateral movement bridged by the train ride to Detroit, symbolically a crossing of the mythological River Styx, which transports the Knowles family from the utopia of closeness to the earth to the underworld of pencil, icy heart refrigerators bought on time, destruction of aesthetics and creativity by the inhibiting and intimidating schools, and finally murder, both literally and figuratively. Gertie Neville's arrival in Detroit is met with consternation on the part of the children, her children, especially by the bright and sensitive 12-year-old Reuben, her oldest boy, and depart the train when arriving there during World War II. Are no rights. Gertie had no time to think of where she went or why. 
The press of people so hurried her up the long steel ramp that Cassie, clinging to her coattail, screamed with fright. Though she already had two split baskets on one arm and Amos on the other, she tried to pick up the child, but could not bend among the pushing, tightly packed bodies. She took an uncertain step back toward the gate and stood on tiptoe, trying to see down the ramp. She stepped backward. One split basket hit something. She turned, and a woman's eye under a red scarf glared at her, and a wide red mouth said, Hillbilly, spitting the words as if they shape vile thing to be spewed out quickly. She tried to put a, bone, a tone of authority into her voice. It hush and grab hold of Cassie here and get her out of this. She reached the bench at last, and the children got off and gave her the place they had saved for her. She dropped upon it and sat breathing hard. The older children stared at her, more surprised by her strange, weak ways than by all the goings-on around them. Clyde smiled at her mother's fear, hesitated, then looked at Enoch as if for help. Gertie Neville's that we see here at the beginning of Chapter 2 is remarkable because of the, the uh, dramatic juxtaposition to the Gertie Neville's in Chapters 1 through 10. The woman who in chapter one performs an emergency tracheotomy on her son Amos and who succeeds in astounding an army officer by her fierce zealotry in forcing him to stop his car in order that she get her son to a physician. The Gertie that we first meet draws sustenance from her heritage of pride and belief in self, in her resourcefulness, agrarianism, tenacity, an inexorable cussedness in the face of adversity. She is large and strong and sure and doggedly resolute. And so almost with disbelief do we see her drained of this power and control through social dislocation, which leaves her frail, timid, and pliant. How technically does Arnaud realistically cause Gertie, who is drawn to her own land and people, who through her secret hoarding of now has enough to accomplish her dream by buying her own property so that she is holden to no one. How does Arno master the realistic motivation to bring it off, <coughs> to cause her to leave this place of mind and soul and heritage? Within Gertie's past and present locale in Ballou, Kentucky, is her belief in family tradition and belief in firm and fixed male-female <coughs> obligations. Ironically, the character foil, who, in the final analysis, uproots Gertie, is her mother. The pious, Calvinistic, fault-finding, guilt-rendering, motivational force, who convinces Gertie that she must change her environment for the sake of her husband and children. The plausibility of Gertie's change of heart is based on those qualities of traditional social mores, role expectations, and religious forces. The religious conflict brought about by her inability to accept hardcore Calvinistic theology becomes a determined quest to understand self through finding the face of Christ in her carvings and through empathy with the biblical Judas. Gertie is naive and unannounced agnostic, rejecting religious fundamentalism not by overt rebellion but instead by self-questioning doubt of what she has been taught. One side of her nature and non-verbalized theology is seen in Callie Lou, imaginary playmate of her daughter Cassie. Callie Lou is the idealized earth child, reflecting Gertie's pantheistic beliefs in the singing Christ, in naturalness and simplicity is the good life without complex philosophical concerns. But the other side of Gertie is the Judas image with which she identifies the traitor, not the idealized personage of her singing Christ. In Detroit, Cassie dies and Callie Lou dies with her. The Christ that Gertie tries to carve from the cherry wood dies also. What remains is Judas, as Gertie, guilt-ridden because of Cassie's death, and because she feels that she has betrayed Reuben, her son, who runs away from the metro war scene and returns to Kentucky, tries to live on in what appears to be her destined, though undesired life in Detroit, her earthly hell. 
Bertie's carving reflects her religious search. Arno writes, The man in the wood at first seemed far away, walled off. But gradually the thing in the wood came closer and yielded itself as chips and shavings fell. <coughs> Emily Dickinson once wrote of Christ, when he speaks to his father, we distrust him. This is a direct quote. When he tells us of his heavenly home, we turn away. But when he tells us he is acquainted with grief, we listen, for that is an acquaintance of our own. And so it is with Gertie Neville, who is acquainted with grief in a place with which she has no affinity. American artist George O'Keefe said about New Mexico, Quote, as soon as I saw it, I knew it was my country. I never felt at home in the East like I do out here. I feel like myself out here, and I like it, Unquote. The sense of place is where one achieves sense of self. There is a sense of harmony, a mystical, transcendental quality of being. Some are born where they belong. Others if they are lucky or persistent, perceptive, perceptive enough for the realization that each person does have a place, find where they belong. It is Gertie Neville's sad fate that she was born in the right place, but through circumstances lost it. Lo losing her place is the real tragedy of the novel. A third way in which Arnaud communicates a sense of place in The Doll Maker is through rhetoric which clarifies experience. She writes, There was no whiteness of rock or glimmer of starlight under the pines to mark the craggy path down the ridgeside spring. But she followed the path with no more thought for her feet than she would use to cross the kitchen floor. The spring seeped into a hollowed-out sandstone basin at the foot of a low bridge, and without being able to see where stone ended and water began, she squatted by the pool and dipped the bucket in, then lifted it and drank easily and soundlessly from the great thick rim as others might have sipped from a china cup. John Steinbeck said that he wrote to inform himself in our nose prose, there is this sense of the writer informing herself in that her diction and syntax assist her in establishing a relationship to her place. In Detroit, Gertie's life is reduced to a daily struggle over money, payments of rent, appliances, an automobile, food. There is no time to observe, to think, to be in touch. Life is constantly intense, a permanent, never-ending struggle among human automatons. Unlike the clarification produced by the omniscient authorial view stance, the character's oral expression is severely limited. The novel deals with human beings to whom language is not a means of expressing reality, much less changing it. Gertie Neville's and the people of her mountain culture express little to one another in words. Gertie's identification and commonality are with the outdoors, the land, and her expression comes through her carving. Gertie does not share her ideas and hopes with her husband Clovis because her knowledge of language does not suffice to deal with abstractions. She locks her door and in secret counts the money that she has saved to buy the Tipton base, not sharing with Clovis that which is her greatest desire, to own the land and to have a permanent home for her family. The great irony of this novel comes after the move to Detroit, after Cassie is violently killed by the train and Clovis is involved in murder, when Clovis tells her that if he had known she had saved enough money for the Tipton property that they would never have come to the city. This lack of fluency caused by her limited exposure to language limits her ability to communicate with her son Reuben. Reuben is horned by what he sees as inconsistencies in his mother as she breaks her promise to him in that in what he sees as a capricious decision to abandon their plans to buy the land and instead go to the war factory. Gertie does not communicate to him or to anyone the reasons for her change of heart. 
She does not perceive of his need for explanation until too late. If she had, perhaps her communication with him would have helped to share her own thought and thus challenge her decision. With her daughter Cassie, the same problem occurs. Gertie does not relate to the child her real feelings about the imaginary Callie Lou, but instead drives the needed to see child away. Because the other children feel that Cassie is strange in associating with this imaginary friend. The influence of her limited agrarian tradition again prohibits her from verbalizing these thoughts. In his book of essays called Visions from San Francisco Bay, Nobel Prize winner Shazlof Miloche says that his homelessness makes his integration in America easier. Um, I might add that Miloche was born in Lithuania, that he um, grew up in Poland, uh, spent 10 years in France, and has now lived in this country for 30 or 35 years. He says that his homeless, homelessness makes integration in America easier because, quote, its American inhabitants have always suffered from homelessness and uprootedness. No wonder that the core of American literature has always been the question, who am I, unquote. Robert Penn Morin says that literary regionalism is more than a literary matter and is not even primarily a literary matter. That if it is treated as a purely literary matter, it will promptly lose any meaning, for only in so far as there springs from some reality and experience is valuable to us. Writing in Mountain Life and Work, Bill West says, that the myth of the melting pot is responsible for the peculiar experience a mountain child so often gets in school. In describing his experience as a third grader in the western North Carolina hills, he says, after drifting through two years of Dick and Jane, their dog Spot and their fashionably thin mother and father who live in a fashionable house founded by a picket fence, I became very excited about a story in my reader which depicted a lifestyle similar to that which I was exposed to in my community and of which I was a living part. It mattered little to me that the story concerned a Laplander family in Finland. I had found a story with which I could identify and I read it and reread it until the pages were ready to fall out. Alessandro Ortelli, a professor at the University of Rome who has recently visited uh, Appalachia and its culture, says that the migration of mountain families to large cities reveals insights in their natures, to their nature. Ortelli says that mountain people never really live their mountains. They consider themselves sojourners wherever they go. They're not absorbed by the cities, and that means their point of view is more detached. They are more critical, not necessarily in a negative way, but because they are different and they know they are different, he says. Italy and Appalachia share a symbolic bond, he says. Both are colonies of the American empire and lie on the periphery of power held by Wall Street, Washington, and Hollywood. Law nicely writes, it is the place that matters the place at the heart of things. A man has a right to his place. This feeling runs deep in life. It brings stray cats running over endless miles and birds homing from the ends of the earth. <coughs> Isley says that it is, it is as though all living creatures, and particularly the more intelligent, can survive only fixing or transforming a bit of time into space or by securing a bit of space with its objects immortalized and made permanent in time. The attachment to a place is the attachment of the spirit to a grouping of events in time. It is part of our morality, he says. The sense of place in the doll maker appears not to be confined to one small region so much as it is to the symbolic process. The Kentucky land is still with Gertie Neville's, although she does not literally return to it, despite what you see in the film, 
which was very well done, I think, the film in which Jane Fonda uh, starred. But if you will recall, at the end of that, we get feeling, in fact, we're almost literally told, aren't we, that they are going home to Kentucky. We see them heading in that direction. That is not the way, if you are familiar with the book, The Dollmaker, that Harriet Arnault ends it. Gertie's place resides in memory. It is that which is still and always with her. Arnaud's appreciation and love of her land came at a time when it was not popular to love Southern Appalachia. Her attachment to her place, but more than that, her deep pride in the Appalachian Hollow, a place that many people might have seen as shabby and sterile, is unique and somewhat remarkable. Sense of place in Arnaud's a doll maker is indelible and synonymous with spirit. I really didn't know any of you would uh, be familiar with John Ely. Uh, I assumed he'd be something like myself. I had no familiarity with him until a few years ago. Walking in here this morning, I ran into a person who not only collects and reads John Ely, but also knows him. Uh, so obviously there's a lot more people in tune with John Ely than I, than I thought. Uh, what I've done with this paper, attempted to do, is uh, I've selected three novels out of a rather large group of novels. Uh, he's written about two families, the Wrights and the Kings. Um, it's about seven books. Uh, begun, began in uh, 1962 with Lion on the Hoth and goes up 1984, The Last One Home. Uh, the books I've selected, though, are ones which don't particularly deal with you know, important kind of, I guess, developments in American, uh, American thought, American history, like, for instance, the, the Road would be a, a pretty good book to probably use in a symposium like this because it deals with a mountain and blasting through a mountain, putting on this railroad, and how them's alive and really abstracts human blood for what happens to the mountain, but um, uh, I haven't used that because it's, to me it concentrates on a, uh, an element of uh, American social history, which is rather important. I use the uh, what about the Civil War, um, called the Time of Drums. Uh, they have selected basically a, uh, somewhat set in times that obviously were important, uh, but there wasn't an important thing going on. Uh, I have selected The Land Breakers, uh, Journey of August King, and The Winter People. I was told this morning that The Winter People is being made into a film right now, uh, so I can save the trouble of reading the book, possibly. Uh, Ely has also done nonfiction, uh, very much involved in race missions in um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and a book came out of that. And, also, Cheap Wine of Great Britain. He's done a book on, on that, so he's seen many things. Uh, that's a background for me. some of you who know nothing about him. This paper is called Adjusting the Codes, Affirming the Place, Ely's The Winter People, and the emphasis, a lot of half of the paper is The Winter People. By the way, codes, uh, I'm in literature, and so therefore I don't use these terms where a social scientist would. It's, a code is simply a behavior which is expected by um, people within the confines of the, uh, of the book. Hemingway does this, and uh, you know, this is a very typical literary technique, and you have a two-dimensional character um, that you can identify with very easy. The film uses this constantly. At the conclusion of The Winter People, 1982, William Wright and Drew Campbell, heads of family, come together and agree to settle a feud that threatens life and the community's stability. While the settlement is unusual, the agreement by family heads follows the code of hierarchy long accepted and practiced in the mountains. The startling feature of the agreement focuses on Coley Wright, who initiates the compromise by going to the Campbell with the gift of her son. To maintain life, she unselfishly curbs her motherly privileges by presenting this peace offering to the old warlord who has moved in such a manner that revenge as a means of problem-solving problem subsides. 
The life principle portrayed by John Ely becomes the guide that governs each characters and situations in his body of fiction and is the author's basis for adjusting mountain codes that appear more rigid than they are. Ely's dramatization of this concept offers hope and identity to a people and land he holds in high esteem. This paper attempts to analyze the author's evolution of this idea through selected fiction beginning with The Land Breakers in 1964, when Ely's mountain community headed by Mooney Wright begins. Ely clarifies and identifies his character types early in the stories so the reader is able to focus on particular traits of the central figures. For instance, in The Land Breakers, Tinkler Harrison is characterized by wealth and possessiveness, the opposite of Mooney Wright. Of greater importance, Harrison is an entrepreneur while Mooney is a pioneer and farm. Land is more than an investment to the latter who nurtures and accommodates it as he does the woman he marries and family he maintains. Commitment to the land and community likewise differentiates him from others as the character types increase such so herders and hunters in the journey of August King, 1971, whose attitude to the land and farmers is exploitative. Though these works fiction are set in past times, their themes and characterizations are true to contemporary life. Another important trait of each hero is a strong-willed determination. While some may view this as stubbornness, Ely portrays Mooney Wright in a positive vein. After 12 years of servitude, he leaves the estate that he serves, though the only request he stay. He understands life in the mountains will be more difficult than his present condition, and he still sets out. Lured by a sense of independence and belief in the stewardship found in owning the land. Even when the attempt to bring animals and goods to market over a treacherous trail fails, Mooney still persists in his labor and ideals. Even when Lacey Pollard returns to claim his wife and family and offers Mooney land in return, the latter becomes more determined though he knows love and society are against him. Again, his persistence rewards him in the loyalty and recognition he achieves among the community. He is the model of stability, determination, and hard work, and his relationship with the non-human natural world around him is one of respect and almost reverence. A further characteristic of Ely's fiction is personification of the mountains. This occurs in the consciousness of the main characters in The Land Breakers and the journey of August King, and dramatizes their sensitiveness to an awe of the land. After the burial of Amy Wright, the reader enters Mooney's mind. Quote, The mountain is talking, he thought. It has her, his deceased wife, and it's jaw, and it's talking to me now. It sees me here yet, and sees these others who have come here. It hovers over us and tells us that this is only the beginning for those who stay in the village." Unquote. This is not a romantic vision of benevolence or beauty, but one of death and the mountain's legacy. Ironically, this death is a further affirmation of life because in both the stories named above, the central characters communicate with the dead as they ask advice regarding life matters. The connections of the living and the dead and their ties to the earth and body is spirit, which is circular and nourishing as the ideal these characters pursue. <coughs> life, death, and the land interweave and form a pattern of the balancing and overriding spirit permeating their lives. Ely develops this idea more extensively in the latter story, The Journey of August King, where it becomes the basis for the expiation of King's guilt. The hero violates two codes, one from his father of never touching a black person, and the other from society of never aiding a runaway slave. He even thinks of another code, that from the courtly Middle Ages, when he fantasizes the rescue of the black girl, Annalise, as a knight would princess or queen. King consciousness of these codes is necessary in Ely's development of the life principle, for it indirectly motivates him to assist the runaway and break one of the external codes. In summary, 
To alleviate his guilt, the hero must assist and free the runaway and all sacrifice his animal holdings for a farmer necessity. He gives all to satisfy the gnawing memory of Sarah's death. Sarah has taken her life. She has jumped to her death. An example is an unusual scene which occurs on the journey when King cuts the throat of the calf he has recently purchased. No explanation and at the moment no reason exists for the action that is basically against his usual behavior to aid anything alive. Only in the context of the overall metaphor of the journey does this sacrifice make sense and that King is seeking the counterbalance to the broken codes of his father and society and accepting the responsibility of his deceased wife. A calf is the first of offered losses, followed by a pig, geese, and his one horse. At the fiction's con conclusion, he is waiting to be burned out of his farm by hunters who blame him for the escape of Annalise. Even when Mooney Wright gives King a reasonable story that will exonerate him in society's eyes, King refuses because he feels the expiation of wrongdoings depends on the public acknowledgement of them. As the fiction draws to a close, E's hero is alone on the land he has developed, though without means of maintaining the farm that he has recently paid off. His prospects seem slim, except when he reconciles himself with Sarah and is at peace in his own heart. Early in the story, the, or the author presents an insight into King that will account for elements of character and the conclusion of the narrative. As King prepares to return to farm and before he encounters Annalise, he spends the night in an inn in the company of hunters and planters. From the third person omniscient point of view, the reader learns King's prejudices. Quote, Augustus liked, distrusted both sets of men and preferred his own, the earthy, dirt poor farmers from Scotland and England and many, who struggled with the land using their own hands living with their own fast. The land redeemed them. It even cleansed. But then the land absorbed them, which was fair, or at least had a sense of right to it, August felt. End of book. <coughs> King's alienation from the community and his farm without the needed animals gives him a sense of starting over so the land can absorb him and balance his life. Death in the land can be fulfilled now that he is cleansed. His journey and condition confirm his redemption in the land, his only companion, and in terms of the fiction, his only refuge. The honest and loving person's path is very narrow in Italy's portrayal of the still figure. Between the journey of August King and the winter people, Ely shifts his focus from male to female and develops the mountain woman, Collie Wright. She has many of the same humane qualities as King and the Earl Mooney Wright. And she also defies code, society, and acts and enforces. While she loses her child, Jonathan, she is not alone because of the loving outsider, Wayland Jackson, who marries her. Eve's use of the outsider and the testing of him provide other instances of defying codes that enable the author to project another facet of the life principle that shapes his vision of Appalachia and its people. As the setting of Ely's series of novels moves into the 20th century, the material becomes more complex and demands a more involved organization of characters and situations to maintain the themes that, than did the previous single central figures set in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Wayland, the clockmaker, serves as an outside influence not denied to mountain people even in their isolation from mainline society. He undergoes the right usage during the bear hunt in his encounter with Cole Campbell, whom he almost kills. Ironically, he finds himself in Appalachia when his truck breaks down and he has no desire to leave. Unlike the fiction writer Gurney Norman, who returned to Russia, Wayland is here for the first time and brings a creative talent other than writing or reporting. He has not come to investigate or rehabilitate Appalachian life. He is here to work alongside the local people and appreciate and absorb their values. He is a good mate and a balance of collie. 
and in two scenes, when he first meets her and when he returns from the hunt, he stands on respectful ritual, acknowledging her person and her right to refuse him. He is unlike mountaineers, and he has no preconceived set of foods on which to base his interaction with Kali and others. He relies on the life principle and basic human dignity to work himself in community. Because he is not a person of land, the land is not his refuge as it is to Mooney and Kang. Because of the emphasis on the Kali Wayland relationship, Edie for focuses the relationship of the individual and the land on William Wright, who instructs Paula in the love, history, and beauty of the mountains. She is an attentive pupil. The brief and connection of Wayland to the land is dramatized during the annual bear hunt. For Wayland, the hunt is as much initiation to the mountains as it is to his manhood. He never did before, and in the eyes of Kali, the ritual is unnecessary, for she does not want him to be like the rest of men. On the first day of the hunt, he realizes he is, quote, thoroughly out of place, high on the mountain at a windy gap. The wind just now sweeping across them, making whines, moans, and gusty whispers as real as spoken words, unquote. When Wayland jumps on the wounded, the reader knows he's out of place, but understands he is embracing the world of the mountains as only one not born in them can do. In another passage, Wayland summarizes the camp, quote, no woman would stay up here. No child would ever be born here, he imagines. It was a male place, and he was beginning to accept, to admire it as such some instinct long buried inside of him was reason to it." End of quote. This is as close to the land and its meaning Wayland can discover and discern. Unlike Ely's other heroes or protagonists, he has not come to farm or exploit the land, though he has consented to its life-death cycle, and perhaps is a new type of mountain person who desires to contribute the integrity of Appalachian values based in the land. When he returns from the hunt, Kali welcomes him and recognizes his place in her life and the communities. Quote, they came together, laughing, and that was the way he arrived home that evening, the second time he had come to her house from off the mountain. Unquote. The words home and off the mountain give him a share in Appalachian heritage. Three novels analyzed in this paper focus on Ely's depiction of Appalachian society as crazy, life-supporting, and valuable in the overall scheme of American social history. By isolating the people and region, the author challenges the reader to compare life in the southern Appalachian highlands within society or other ethnic groups certainly more familiar to the American experience. It depicts the people as strong-willed and at times stubborn, and he also portrays their endurance, willingness to work despite small rewards, and adjustment to and communion with the land that sustains them. In the winter people, he shifts from his previous emphasis on the strong individual to the pair of central figures and the harmony they create. The adherence to a life principle stands out in the development of the body of fiction from the first novel in the mountain series. Serves as the basis and assist in the formation of codes and expected behaviors that define the framework of Ely's fictional milieu. However, the codes are not immutable, especially when they clash with the life principle, as in the cases of King and Collie Wright. The hero establishes a different or new pattern that expiates wrongdoing or guilt, and points to renewal and subsequent adjustment of out promoted attitudes and behaviors. In conclusion, Ely's portrayal of hill people as sensitive and spiritual, with a strong faith in self and the land, withstands the mass media's depiction of them as backward and gullible. Ely's world is not a perfect society. It is an area and group of people that call recognition and appreciation of the values they embody. Thank you. First off, uh, I pretend to be an Appalachian scholar. Uh, Dr. Grody mentioned uh, coming home to Appalachia. Well, I'm one of those fellows that did the same thing. 
Uh, I uh, have one unique qualification for being an Appalachian scholar. I was born a block from a coal mine, 100 yards from a coal mine. My colleague, Paul Lovengood, was born in the Great Smoky Mountains, Western North Carolina, so, you know, that gave us a great start, I guess. Uh, but we both went away from it for a long time, and uh, then about 25 years, uh, I was offered a position about 25 years ago, a position at a place called Appalachian State University, which I, or Appalachian State Teachers College it was at the time. I never heard of it, but it had that name, and I didn't ask a salary or anything else. I just came there and went to work. Uh, begin to wonder about this after a little while, but uh, they've been pretty good to me. Anyway, uh, Paul and I <coughs> became acquainted about that time, uh, went off and did some other things, and uh, one day about 10 years ago, we were sitting of all places on the banks of the San Antonio River in San Antonio, Texas. Hadn't seen each other for about a year, and we were swapping yarns as to what we were going to be doing next, and uh, we had both been very much interested in Appalachia, taught courses in it a number of years. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to map southern Appalachia. And he said, well, uh, you having any luck? And I said, well, if it weren't, didn't have so many counties. And I was cutting out all these little pieces of zipatone and sticking them on maps, and it took me months to do this. And uh, he said, well, I've just got a new technique out that uh, we've discovered is a thing called a computer that we can generate maps with. Well, uh, you all know about computers, don't you? They generate more than you can possibly use. And so we started generating these maps by computer, and we discovered that uh, it didn't take long to generate the maps. It still took just as long to interpret them, though. So we started out, we were going to do a, decided to make something called a reference atlas. Now, I don't know whether you've ever seen a reference atlas or not. Geographers are great for mapping things so they can see the patterns and so forth. And uh, we decided to do a reference atlas. We are going to make it about that thick with all these computer-generated maps. The trouble is we couldn't find anybody who wanted to publish anything like that. So we decided to break it in pieces. And so we started out a couple of years ago. We generated a few maps just for fun. And uh, since we couldn't put everything in we wanted to, we just took a sampling of different kinds of maps. And you can see that uh, they're not real fancy, but they print very nicely. They're black and white. The computer does a pretty good job. It, it doesn't have that pizzazz that a real hand-drawn map has, but we started generating these maps, and uh, like I say, it took longer, about five times as long to do this side as it did this side. Put up just a little interpretation there, just a, point, a place to start. But then with the reference atlas, the idea is you allow the reader to make some of his own conclusions or her own conclusions out of what you see in a reference atlas. nice part about it is you can, you can take a uh, county or a region or whatever you want, and you can pull it through. You can, you can track it through. You can develop a profile of a county or a profile of a set of counties or the counties in the state or any way you want to do it. As you know, all regions are arbitrary. You have to have some reason for developing a region. This particular region here is 156 counties in what we call the Southern Highlands. Now, those 156 counties were developed in a rather arbitrary way. They were developed by looking at the service area of an organization called the Appalachian Consortium. Have any of you heard of this? It's a consortium of uh, universities and agencies like the Blue Ridge Parkway, the Forest Service, people like that. Uh, there are 14 different agencies and institutions in it, and it's all volunteer. Nobody gets paid for anything. Uh, everything that we do is just free work. You just slave away at it. And uh, uh, we, dis we found out that different agencies would pay for the printing of this sort of thing. That's all, just the printing. So it's been put together by hand by students and this sort of thing. So we started with volume one, an introduction, uh, got the TVA interested in it, and so they helped us print that one. And that one was received very well. And we ran out of them a couple of years ago. So then we did one on agriculture using the census of agricultural materials that came out. The nice thing about the technique is that uh, we use data from computer tapes, which means that we don't have to look up anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it comes from the tape to the map. It's a very neat proposition. It only takes a couple million dollars worth of machinery to do this, but at the University of South Carolina, they're the state data center, and they've got lots of money. And so uh, that's the way it's... Well, that worked out pretty well, and then the Appalachian Regional Commission 
uh, saw it and said, hey, we've been wanting to do something on health care, and Paul and I know nothing about health care, but we managed to get about 90 mad out of it and uh, a little bit of interpretation. So I just wanted to let you know how we got into this, and uh, if some of you have a, just a burning desire to own one of these, uh, I have a few uh, with me, just uh, just a small handful that I'll be glad to let you have. Uh, but you'll have to have really burning desire. Don't take it home and put it on the shelf. If you want to look at it, fine. But anyway, uh, when we talked to uh, Professor Whitson, uh, he said, well, our conference has got a little bit of your area in it, but we're interested in something we call Central Appalachia. So where in the world is Central Appalachia? Does anybody, can you define that? Uh, you know. Well, no, that isn't. That's more, there's, a, there's part of Central Appalachia in that this part here is in Central Appalachia. The rest of it is in Southern Appalachia. Now, when I say Central and Southern, whose Appalachia am I talking about? I mean, you've heard of a thing that used to exist called the Appalachian Regional Commission? Okay. So what we did, because we didn't know any definition of Central Appalachia, we went ahead and used the definition of that was set out by the Appalachian Regional Commission. And this is our Appalachia, our central Appalachia. Now, in interpreting the maps that we did for this particular conference, and this was done just for this conference, uh, we're into some territory we don't know a whole lot about. And uh, so if we have erred in some of our interpretation, you're going to have to correct us. Now, because uh, we've got the television here, it's not going to help the overhead projection a whole lot. So why don't I give you a set of uh, a set of maps so you can follow along. And uh, yeah, if you'll pass those out, just give everybody a set. You can tear them apart at the staple. You can just tear them apart and uh, kind of follow along. I think uh, when you're using maps, you have to have a map. That's all there is to it. And looking at it on the overhead is really a poor substitute for the real thing. <coughs> how many uh, how many geographers do we have in the crowd, Mr. Jerry? Uh, you all know what geographers do? When uh, people say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a geographer, they said, they say, oh, you know where everything is. <laughs> well, I don't know where anything is. I have to go look it up in Annapolis somewhere. I'm not interested in that much in locating places. I'm interested in understanding what that place is all about. And so we say that geography is a science of aerial differentiation. Aerial, not as seen from the air, but aerial in the sense that it's spread across Earth space. Any phenomenon that we encounter is spread in some way across space, isn't it? Not outer space, Earth space, okay? Now, we can get a sense of how that is by mapping it. And so that's why this mapping procedure uh, works pretty well. Uh, geographers develop their sense of place not only by looking at it, not only by feeling it with emotion, but they look at it by looking at data. And data is just that. It's just stuff. So you've got to map it and interpret it before it becomes information or intelligence. And so this is what we're trying to do here. We're trying to take this particular piece of Earth space that we call Central Appalachia, as defined by some agency. And as you know, some of that definition was political. But anyway, we're looking at that in terms of what that place is all about. So one cannot speak geographically without reference to places. That's what it's all about. Significance of places can be better understood by examining the pattern of aerial relationships within a region or regions of concern. It's the region and its attributes that people identify as their sense of place. Sense of place implies something more than just physical distinction in the landscape. It also includes elements of cultural diversity. Come in, folks. Uh, Gary, do we have plenty of those handouts? I've got another bunch here if we need. 
It's akin to regionalism and results from an awareness of aerial differences. Regionalism and hence sense of place are usually stronger in mountainous areas because of their marked physical distinction from surrounding areas and the effect of isolation. The physical distinction invariably leads to cultural differentiation, which further strengthens regionalism and sense of place. Because sense of place is derived from an awareness of aerial differences, the purpose of this study is to analyze a variety of socioeconomic data for Central Appalachia in order to determine its regional character. Such analysis should demonstrate whether Central Appalachia is a region within itself or is a compage of smaller regions, each possessing unique characteristics. The emphasis here is on selected elements of the cultural landscape with little or no reference to the physical because it's so well known in terms of its role in defining said place. The results of such a study, although not all encompassing, should give a better understanding of region central Appalachia and a clearer picture of sense of place. Now, the data that we used in this study, study were selected from various publications by the U.S. Bureau of the Census, the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, and churches and church membership in the United States. The data selected were analyzed using accepted statistical techniques and presented here gradually using computer-produced tables and maps. Culture can be defined as the sum total of the way of life of a society, and in a study such as this, it would be impossible to examine all elements of cultural diversity. For discussion here, authors have chosen one, population, two, earnings from specific industries, three, dominant adherent nominations in terms of religion, and 17 other socioeconomic variables in a multi-factor arrangement. As such, this study is only an example of how different cultural attributes influence sense of place. Now, if you look at your map on the study area, it consists of 85 counties in a four-state area, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, and Tennessee. 49 of the counties are in Kentucky, the bulk of them, 20 in Tennessee, 7 in Virginia, and 9 in West Virginia. This is the Central Appalachian Region, as defined by the Appalachian Regional Commission, and is that portion of Appalachia that traditionally has had the least urbanized population, the lowest levels of income and educational attainment, the poorest housing, and has lagged far behind regional and national averages in many other socioeconomic measures. Let's think about the area in terms of its population. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, quote, from time immemorial, the human being has been structured in such a way that his world outlook, his motivations, scale of values, his actions and intentions, are determined by his own personal and group life experiences. End quote. All aspects of population, in a sense, affect the social organization of a culture. How the people in a given area live, how they interact with one another, and how they use and affect the land, and so forth. The character of the population of an area will impact on the development of one's sense of place. It's beyond the scope of study to make a thorough analysis of population in central Appalachia, but a look at certain elements of its population may aid in understanding aerial differences. As stated earlier, it can be argued that a sense of place is derived from an awareness of aerial differences. The total population for the study area, as of 1980, was 2.1 million, just slightly above the population for the state of West Virginia. On a county basis in 1980, the population varied from a low of 4,358 in Pickett County, Tennessee, which is this itty bitty county right here, kind of a funny shape, Pickett County, to a high of 86,821 in Raleigh County, West Virginia, which is way over in here, and is in the Beckley-Princeton uh, corridor. Population per square mile, that is density, which is a better way of looking at it, varied from a low of 17.3 in Van Buren County, Tennessee, which is on the very southern edge of the area, 
to a high of 346 persons per square mile in Boyd County, and you all know about Boyd County if you're from around here. Uh, let's see, that's Flint, isn't it? Boyd County. Uh, <coughs> most of the population is rural. Now, we have to define rural, I suppose. In the definition of whether a county is urban or rural, we say that if it's over 50% urbanized, then it's a, an urban county. If it's less than 50% urbanized, it's a rural county. We have to define what urban is. Does anybody know what urban is? It doesn't take much to be urban. If you live in a place, incorporated or unincorporated, with 2,500 people, that's an urban place. Okay? So we look at all the places to see if there are 2,500 or more population, and if 50% or more of the people live in places of that size, then we call it an urban county. Okay? Strictly a miracle device, which doesn't have any emotional overtone to it at all. Most of the population is rural with only three counties, Boyd, Clark, and Madison, is Boyd County here. Clark and Madison uh, are not far from here. Uh, that's uh, Richmond and Winchester, I guess. Uh, uh, these are the three counties that have more than 50% of the population classified as urban. And of course, uh, two of those are sort of related to Lexington, which changes things around a little bit. 34 counties had 100% of their population in the rural category in 1980. Now, during the decade 1970 to 1980, something very interesting happened in this region. In prior decades, the whole region lost population. Almost every county lost population in the two previous decades. But from 70 to 80, for the area as a whole, the increase was about 21.2%. Only one county lost population, and that was this one right here, McDowell County in West Virginia. Has anyone been there? Not hard to understand why nobody wanted to stay. Am I treading on any toes? I hope not. But McDowell County lost population. And population change varied. It didn't lose much, only a minus 1.5%, which compared to losses of previous years, when there was much as 10 or 15% per county, this really isn't a significant loss. Uh, from a low 1.5% in McDowell County to a high of 48.5% in Martin County. That was a gain of 48.5% in Martin County. I've forgotten where it is, but... Uh, okay. Okay, here's Pike County. Yeah, there's Pike. Oh, Martin County. And uh, I can't explain that one. Can you? Okay. You want to help us? It's just that they opened up a lot of mines. Okay. All right. And this made Pike County, made Pike go somewhat too as being the financial center of that area. There's so many little things that enter into this whole thing. When you start mapping it, you have to ask yourself some strange questions. As why is it like that? Uh, for example, we often find that a county will, will be very anomalous. That is, it just doesn't fit. And then we discover that there's some reason for that. For example, in our own area, uh, our county that uh, I live in, Watauga County, always shows up very strangely. We'll have the lowest per capita income and highest educational levels in the whole area. And that's strange. Why low per capita income and high education level? Then you look, there's 11,000 students there. Okay? They all got more than a high school education, which pushes that up, and they all have no income, which pushes the per capita income up. And, you know, there's silly little things like that that enter into things. That, that's why I have to ask you why, Mark. Oh. All right. Anyway, that's a very brief look at population and some of the things you can do with it. They could have shown a map of density and uh, other things here, but uh, these are just some examples. Let's try another tack here. Let's look at earnings from specific industries. The people of central Appalachia, by using tools techniques available to them, have interacted with their environment to produce a material world that is a result of their way of life, and at the same time a cause of it. Uh, the, the, the technological world has entered 
central Appalachia. If you don't believe it, just fly over it at a low altitude. See how much the face of that landscape has changed as a result of technology and changing technology. Yesterday afternoon, I came across the mountains at about uh, 2,000 feet above the ground, and I've done that many times, and every time I come over, there's a rather marked amount of change, the amount of the landscape that's being affected and the way it's being affected. Uh, for a long time, all you saw was brown, where the scars were. Now we're beginning to see a combination of brown and green, and every time you come over, more of it's green and brown. And this is because of reclamation programs, which uh, you don't notice so much on the surface, but you certainly notice them by looking from the air. Economic activities like agriculture, mining, manufacturing, all associated with a different way of life, each impacting uniquely on the development of one sense of place. The remaining counties, earnings from farming vary from a low or less than 1%. If you notice over here on the uh, legend, the various uh, patterns from a low of less than 1% to a high of over 27%, and that's a pretty good proportion for any county. The counties with the highest earnings from farming generally have locations on the perimeter of the study area. Notice out in here, uh, pretty much on the perimeter. And uh, of course, much of that related to the physiographic characteristics. As you know, as you taper off onto this side of the region, we get into a little more flat land. On the, we're coming to the edge of the plateau there, and the dissection is not nearly so pronounced there. The northeast and southwest I do here have very low earnings from farming. Of course, we know what they farm there. If they farm at all, it's un what's called underground farming. It's on top of the ground now. But that's the coal mining counties. So let's look at mining. <coughs> it's been said that coal mining in soft coal fields of central Appalachia has produced people who have learned to absorb tragedy in their daily lives by their tradition of fastic, silent courage, by their elemental religion and by hope. Coal production, particularly in earlier times, was an extremely labor-intensive sector of the economy. As a result, larger concentrations of population developed in the mining areas as compared to the farming areas. This larger concentration of working people interacting under circumstances of a strenuous and dangerous occupation led to trade unionism of a rather militant type. Coal mining became a new way of life and people associated with it develop their own sense of place. If we look at uh, earnings from mining, your four and your set of handouts, it's been said that coal mining in the soft coal fields of central Appalachia has produced people who have learned to absorb tragedy, I'm sorry, <laughs> earnings from mining as a percent of earnings from all industries are highly concentrated in the counties of eastern Kentucky southwestern West Virginia, and western Virginia, right in through here. 22 counties have no earnings from mining, but 19 receive more than 30% of their total earnings from mining. Within the study area, earnings from mining as a percent of earnings from all industries varies from a low of zero to a high of 84.3%. Notice that in through here, complete dependence almost upon mining. If we look at manufacturing, compared to agriculture and manufacturing, man is in possession of means of production which are subject to his own will and is totally free from the vagaries of nature. This is to say that the environment plays a lesser role in the development of his sense of place. It is then in this type of productivity that the human factor becomes significant in its fullest sense. If we look at earnings for manufacturing, figure five, earnings for manufacturing as a percent of all earnings from all industries vary dramatically throughout the central Appalachian area. The coal mining counties are almost devoid of earnings for manufacturing. Notice that how thin the earnings for manufacturing are there. And the greatest concentration exists in northern, south, western, and extreme eastern counties. Six counties have less than 5% of the earnings for manufacturing, whereas 33 counties have an excess of 25% of the earnings for manufacturing. Notice how different this is from uh, in Europe, where 
much of the manufacturing sits right on what were at least what, at one time coal fields, and in some cases in northern Appalachia. It can be concluded that in terms of spatial distribution, there is little correlation between farming, mining, and manufacturing. If you look at table one, which is a very simple table of coefficients of correlation, <coughs> notice that there is a weak correlation between farming and manufacturing, but a negative relationship exists between farming and mining and mining and manufacturing. It seems obvious that the development of a sense of place will vary in a like manner. Next thing we looked at was religions. And uh, I hope you don't think I'm an expert on religion because uh, this was a whole new learning experience for me to look at this kind of a thing. Uh, we found some data on religion. Religions are an in integral part of a culture. Each carries a distinct conception of the meaning and value of this life. This contains strictures about what must be done to achieve salvation. Such rules become interwoven with the traditions of a culture. Interaction between people sharing common beliefs produces distinct space patterns, including, including symbolic manifestations in the form of churches and monuments. In many areas, religious faith determines society's modal value system, and the cultural landscape becomes an expression of religious belief. The way people use their land, how they perceive their natural environment, and their attitudes toward their surroundings may all have their basis in religious beliefs. Richard Humphrey has observed that in much of the Appalachians, the sense of place articulated by different religious groups is highly variable. Uh, Richard Humphrey is a uh, Methodist minister in Johnson City, Tennessee. It's commonly known that in this area, there are three forms of religious consciousness in terms of how people relate to their surroundings. The three forms are the religion of Zion, the evangelical, and mainstream Christian. Humphrey further states, quote, whether the concept of place is related to self-identity, to heaven or hell, or to land, home, family, kin, community, church, graveyard, is determined by an individual's religious consciousness, end quote. It is beyond the scope of this paper to delve into details <coughs> of the three forms of religious consciousness. The primary purpose is to establish the existence of aerial differences in this context within central Appalachia. The authors analyzed data for churches and churchship in the study area. <coughs> and selected 10 denominations that could be considered dominant out of the list of 111 denominations appearing on the 1980 church membership tape. The data were then subjected to an in hierarchical grouping procedure. Now this is known as Ward's group algorithm, if you're interested in that sort of thing, in order to develop denominational regions for Central Appalachia. Five regions were identified in MAP. This grouping procedure uh, eliminates certain things and pulls things into particular groups. Dominant adherent denominations as a percent of total adherence is calculated for each of the five regions. And if you look at table two, uh, you have that in your packet there. There are obvious, obviously aerial differences within the study area in terms of religious denominations. Region one, that's the, the very light <coughs> stippled area here. Region one consists of 45 counties with a high degree of contiguity, but it's most, the most widespread region. This region is found in all four states and is dominated by Southern Baptists, United Methodists, and members of other churches. You'll notice that uh, there are 45 counties there, but the Southern Baptist uh, is pretty dominant here. Region two, which is horizontal hatching here, Region 2 is one of the two smallest regions with only seven counties. All counties in this region are contiguous and are located in the north central part of the Kentucky Port Study Area. This is the most diversified region in terms of adherent denominations 
with four different denominations accounting for more than 10% of the total adherents. This region also has considerable membership which is considered by many to be non-mainstream Christian. Region 3, the light vertical hatch, yeah, consists of 18 counties, all contiguous with one exception, concentrated in the south central part of the study area in Kentucky and Tennessee. The area is more dominated by one denomination than any other region. Southern Baptists account for more than 75% of all adherents in the region. In this sense, Region 3 is more typical of the southern part of the United States. Region 4, which is the crosshatch here in the corner, is also the two smallest regions with only seven counties. It has by far the highest number of adherents to the Churches of Christ. Other significant denominations include Southern Baptists and United Methodists. The region is made up of two sets of contiguous counties, contiguous counties in the extreme southwestern portion of the study area in Kentucky and Tennessee. Region 5, which is the strong vertical hatch here, also contains only eight counties, all of which are contiguous and located in the southwestern part of West Virginia. This is the only region with significant numbers of adherents of the American Baptist churches in the USA. See, I guess that's sort of like the Northern Baptist, isn't it, or part of the Northern Baptist. There are an equal number of United Methodists and adherents of other churches. It's obvious that aerial differences in adherent denominations exist in central Appalachia. The only logic con logical conclusion must be that the development of a sense of place will vary in a like manner. As a conclusion to the study, it was decided to investigate the relationships between 17 different variables. And you have your map there. Looking at 17 different variables for the central Appalachian area. No particular plan was used in the selection of the data except to include the earnings variables previously discussed to see how other socioeconomic indicators might correlate with them. We use the same hierarchical grouping procedure that we used on the religion regions and uh, tried to come up with some sort of congruity here. It should be understood that these regions are a product of the spatial associations between all 17 variables as they're related in mathematical space. It's beyond the scope of the paper to discuss in detail all of the attributes of each region. Only the major or obvious characteristics are presented. If you look at region one, which is the crosshatch over here on the southwestern edge, 16 counties located primarily on the periphery, some over here and some here, of the study area. This is a manufacturing and farm area with an older population, if you'll notice on your table, older population had a somewhat lower growth rate than the other regions. Some of the counties appear to operate as service centers, particularly in supplying medical facilities and services. You have to be very careful when you look at medical facilities in a particular county. Uh, they, may be, they may outweigh the number of people, clearly, but they may be a regional center that draws from a surrounding region, and you have to be careful about per capita beds per, per uh, or the number of hospital beds per person or persons per physician if it's at the center. The horizontal hatch, region two, the horizontal hatch here, is the largest with 31 counties which essentially surround the mining counties except on their eastern border. This region falls at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale and seems to have severe problems in terms of quality of life measures. The area has the lowest per capita income in central Appalachia, a high unemployment rate, poor quality housing, and inadequate medical services. Region 3, the close vertical hatch, contains 17 counties with a high of contiguity, located primarily on both sides of the state boundaries between Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. This region is dominated by mining activities has the third highest per capita income, the highest unemployment rate, 
the second highest birth rate. There is little economic activity other than mining. The infant mortality rate is relatively high. Medical facilities are lacking. The region obviously has an unstable economy because of its lack of diversification in production. Region 4, the light stipple. Region 4 includes 13 counties that are widely scattered throughout the study area. All of these counties are urban centers. From 22 to 75 percent of the population is being classified as urban. In fact, eight of the top 10 counties in central Appalachia in terms of urban population are in this region. The urban character is reflected in the social economic conditions within the region. Here one for highest per capita income, the lowest level of poverty, most adequate housing, the largest concentration of manufacturing, the best medical services, the highest level of educational attainment. As far as Central Appalachia is concerned, this region could be described as having the highest quality of life. The last region, Region 5, or the light vertical hatch, find it here, and through here. Region 5 is the smallest with only eight counties located primarily in the north side of Region 3. All eight counties are in the state of Kentucky. This is the growth area in terms of population because it has the highest birth rate, lowest death rate, and lowest median age. In terms of its economy, mining is dominant, but there's a significant amount of manufacturing. Poverty level is high, housing is poor, medical services and facilities are lacking. This is likely to be a very unstable area if fluctuations occur in the economy, and they do. In summary, at the beginning of this paper, it was suggested that sense of place implies something more than just physical distinction in the landscape, it includes elements of cultural diversity. <coughs> it was also suggested that sense of place is derived from an awareness of aerial differences. The authors, authors decided to analyze some selected elements of culture in order to determine whether central Appalachia is a uniform region within itself or a composite of smaller regions, each possessing unique characteristics. In terms of the data chosen, the answer is clear. Central Appalachia is an area of striking aerial differences. It is, in fact, a compage of smaller regions, each possessing unique characteristics. The meaning of sense of place logically must vary in the same manner as the various elements of cultural diversity. Finally, it should be expected that elements of culture, other than those discussed here, would show a similar pattern of spatial variation. Thank you. Um, it would be trite of me to say that I'm happy to be in uh, Moorhead and at Moorhead State this morning. You'd expect me to say that. Uh, but in fact, I am quite happy to be here, particularly the time of year when the proverbial trees are turning. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the references to my moving about uh, for the last 20 years. Um, also says something about the fact, too, that uh, with my trip from Carolina to Kentucky yesterday, uh, this was the 279th time that I have driven from somewhere to Kentucky uh, over the past 20 years since I left home uh, in Harlan, Kentucky <laughs> uh, in 1964. Um, I, I like coming for a number of reasons, basically uh, having to do with family. Uh, part of my references to this notion of the sense of place amongst blacks speaks to my view that the notion of sense of place has more to do for us black people in Appalachia with the sense of peoplehood as opposed to a, a place. Um, when I came from Winston-Salem on Monday, uh, I had the pleasure of stopping uh, once again in uh, Coburn, Virginia, uh, where my 100-year-old grandmama uh, lives. I left her and I drove to Lynch, Kentucky in Harlan County, where my maternal grandmother, who is also 97, lives. So I saw almost 200 years of mothers in the last day or so. Someone I saw a few minutes ago was complaining about the fact, too, that uh, when he arrived at Moorhead yesterday, and I quote him, 
Uh, things were at their usual level of efficiency at Moorhead State University because it was cold in his room or something last night, he said. And I told him that I had the pleasure last night of sleeping on a cot uh, at St. Joseph's Hospital in Lexington, uh, where my father, who spent 50 years of his life under the mountains in Lynch, uh, is uh, struggling with leukemia. So it's good to be here in many, many ways. I want to thank uh, Dr. Whitson for inviting me, and I'm glad to see uh, a number of people I met when I was a scholar in residence a year or so ago here at Moorhead State. Let me uh, go ahead with the body of my remarks. Uh, let me preface it by saying I hand it, hand it, hand it, is that such a word? Passed something out here uh, that appeared in the Courier Journal a few months ago called Black Home in Appalachia. And uh, Bob Hill wrote that feature um, says essentially about blacks in that region about what I would say. And as my grandmom always told me, it isn't what you say, it's how you say it. And uh, he says it much better than I do in a, in a way that may be even more palatable uh, to some persons because uh, what I'm going to say may not necessarily um, uh, sit well. Um, maybe. Okay, here we go. Those of us who consider ourselves students of the black experience in Appalachia, we're very quick to point out that we don't have a vast reservoir of literature that guides our thinking and our research efforts on the people who are black in that region. And when I have attempted to explore whether or not black people in Appalachia place a value, whether they place a meaning, or whether they exhibit a sense of attachment to this place, uh, I turn to one of the most brilliant, effective, but also one of the most ignored persons who'd ever given any thought to black Americans' ambivalent loyalties toward their race and this place called America. He talked about blacks' alienation, about their homelessness, about their emptiness, about their sense of direction and purpose in 1897. Incidentally, that was a time at which black people were beginning to trek through the gaps and the ramparts of the agricultural lowlands of Cotton South, in Alabama particularly, and from the Piedmont of the Carolinas into the coal fields of central Appalachia. In 1897, William Edgar Burghardt Du Bois wrote the following lines. One ever feels his two-ness, an American and a Negro. Two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to obtain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. He would not Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach the Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon." End of quote. That theme, this paradoxical, I'm sorry, this psychological paradox of the American black is of course even more accentuated in the context of the black Appalachian. First, however, in order to study this environment, behavior, sentiment question, the environment and the behavior has to be described and measured independently. Uh, at least you become trapped in what we call a kind of tautological circle. Thus, I'd like to try to make the point that black people in central Appalachia, Harlan County, Kentucky in particular, which is the focus of my research, 
These black people do not share the same sense of identification with the region, nor do they share the same sense of place as that which is normally attributed to mountain white people. And by describing what their environment has meant to them, uh, we can in a way assess black mountain people's behavior, basically their mass out migration, in relation to the environmental contingencies of that region. First, we have to remember that we are focusing in this symposium on the combined phenomenon of phenomenological psychology, rather phenomenological geography, and ecological psychology. On the other hand, the field of humanistic psychology presents us with a lot of findings that are applicable to black adaptation to Appalachia as a behavioral setting. Blacks and whites in Appalachia's coal towns have lived out an interesting, intertwined, rough, and very precarious social and economic existence, as was so brilliantly portrayed in a work by Jim Clotter called The Black South and White Appalachia. In respects, the cultural themes the patterns and ethos of blacks and whites in the mountains are similar. Their diet, their language, their religion, value orientations, their folk knowledge, their folk ways, and their customs. Both, in Helen Lewis's terms, were exploited at the bottom of a class-bound, racist, capitalist system of labor exploitation. But after the pork chops, the poke salad, the collard greens, the turnip greens, the fried chicken, the grits, the cornbread, the syrup and the molasses, the black-eyed peas and the chitlins, and that similar quality of life offered in the mountains industrial plantations, the similarity between black people and white people stops. Black people in the mountains unlike their compatriots whom Roebuck and Henson called Southern Rednecks, were locked at the bottom of a very rigid caste system that breathes quite vigorously in the mountains to this very day. And they suffered the most intense segregation and discrimination in work assignments, in housing, educational opportunities, and the gamut of social, economic, and political life in this staunch conservative stronghold of central and southern Appalachia. I submit right off, therefore, that Appalachia, as reflecting the themes we're going to talk about the next couple of days, the worlds we have lost, James Stills's place, Jim Miller's place, those places we call ancestral homelands, Jesse Stewart's place in Greenup County, and even my mentor John Stevenson's sacred, there is a place somewhere, right down to the White Horse Band's Appalachian Music Night, holds little place in the minds and hearts of the millions of black people who peopled the Appalachians of Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, Southwest Virginia, and southern West Virginia. You might ask then, why does this place, Central Appalachia's Coalfields in particular, why is this place that has been home to black people since the 1700s mean so little, at least in my view, or means such a different thing to them? First, the black people I've interviewed, and I've interviewed 900 hours of them over the past decade, express an insecurity and an uncertainty about Appalachia. As applied to the theory of ecological psychology, black people just don't know about that place. My present book, which is under review by some friends, is entitled Cold-Blooded Blacks. You spell cold, C-O-A-L. Now, perhaps that comes to my readings in sociobiology. But as you know, the temperature and the life force of a cold-blooded mammal is linked to environmental changes. 
When the temperature gets cold, they get cold. When the temperature gets hot, they get hot. And so it is for black people in the mountains. When it has been a boom cycle, they enjoy the prosperity and the relative stability. On the other hand, when things burst, they burst worse for black people. Their lives, their jobs, their families, their homes, their churches, their schools, and their communities have been ruptured, broken, exploded, and shattered. Secondly, in the Appalachia, except for black people of my father's and my grandparents' generation, those over 55 or so, uh, my dad was born and raised in Coburn, Virginia. My mother was born and raised in Benham, Kentucky. Uh, they express a kind of physical and autobiographical insights. Uh, they remember with fondness those halicon days in the mountains when there were these booms. Uh, up to the fourth and fifth decade of this century. But for me, uh, and I'm 42, and other such peers of mine, uh, few of us have any sentimental attachment to Appalachia as a place. For black people in my generation, Appalachia was, and it remains a temporary way station to some other uncertain future out there in the real black America, where at least the paradox is that two-ness, being black and being an American, rather than that three-ness, being black and being an American and being an Appalachian. I firmly believe, and I think my studies support it, though some people question my methodology. Uh, they say I'm a little too close to it. That's still a problem and not mine. But I firmly believe that, with but few exceptions, black people in the Central Highlands define their white compute as the most biased, racially prejudiced, and potentially violent group of people in the United States. As recently as July of this year, one 75-year-old black Harlan told me, half the white folks around here is prejudiced, and I just ain't met other half. In the mountains, as you all well know, complete acceptance of any outsider is unlikely. Even amongst themselves, the whites of central Appalachia, oneself and one's ancestors, have to be for region. You have to be born in the region, and you have to be bred in the region, and you have to conform to the region's racial, class, and political modes to be approved to belong. Blacks who migrate to the mountains, and there are pitifully few of those, are unwanted because of their race per se, and because of the narcissistic uh, 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 fear that these outside blacks would import black militancy. I just ain't met the other half yet. That likely reflects the view that mountain whites hold about most mountain whites. Sorry. Uh, the view that most mountain blacks hold about most mountain whites. That is that they, the whites, are intrinsically mean and stupid. In this way, the black people, just like the white people, view, because it is thought that whites in the mountains view black character traits as being biologically determined. Thus, social relationships between black people and white people in the mountains are characterized by a kind of avoidance syndrome. Blacks reduce the tension that is inherent in this situation by leading, by learning, inferior modes of social response. Black people learn in the mountains how to assume a stance of adaptive inferiority. They inhibit their aggressiveness and present a rather humble demeanor. Of course, in some cases, and in my own view, in too many cases, people let the mask stick to their face. As a consequence, over an extended period of time, Unacquainted black people and white people in the mountains simply ignore each other. Invisible Man could have been written in Harlan County. It could have been written in Gary, West Virginia. It could have been written in Princeton, West Virginia. Invisible Man could have been written in any part of the mountains because black people are simply in theory, uh, invisible. They ignore each other. 
conversations that are protracted in public in Appalachia between black and white people are ignored. And when there is conversation between blacks and whites in the mountains, it is usually confined to triviality and workplace topics. There are no encounters of the third kind. Of course, there is no talk, excuse me, of course, there are no black professionals in the mountains anymore to speak of, largely as a result of the integration, or shall I say the disintegration, of the black school system in the mountains of the South. Uh, the black educated school teachers elude all encounters in the mountains in order to escape the denigration uh, into an inferior caste. So that because of the total configuration of the class system in the Central Highlands, uh, we didn't get the intersecting overlap that was so typical in Cotton South, uh, as we all saw in Gone with the Wind. In the mountains, we had few black cooks and maids and midwives and gardeners and chauffeurs and handymen. Vaulted Appalachian sense of place is less an attachment to a specific place or a land or a location but rather it's an attachment to a particular culture, to a particular class, to a particular kinship network, to a particular home, to a sense of peoplehood, where we share our private joys and our pains, where we have this unique intra-group unity and this unique intra-group security based on our common experiences, our bonds, and our roots. For me, therefore, Appalachia is uh, where my heart is, irrespective of where my feet have roamed. It's a place where racial and economic injustice hardened me to a point that made me be able to adapt to almost any contingency or circumstance in my life. I understood it most clearly when I spent six weeks in South Africa last year. When I walked with black coal miners in South Africa, it reminded me of my own father and grandfather because the labor force dynamics were virtually the same. It gives me a special feeling about the historical reality of racism in my country and about the possibility, the, the, the positive possibility that I still hold along Appalachians, I hope, like you, who feel that we can yet reconcile these warring strivings that we've always had and that we all might attain our self-conscious man and womanhood without being cursed and spit upon. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Tyler, my talk is uh, Appalachia in the Mass Media. At about the time that uh, Professor Whitson called me and asked me to speak, I'm not one of these people that has something made up already, so I said, let's just title it something real vague, and I'll try to have something to fit it later on. Uh, about the same time he got his programs printed up, I realized that I didn't know anything about the mass media, and uh, so uh, working in a 12 county area, area southeastern Kentucky, I don't see very many press releases, and I attend even fewer press conferences, and about 50% of the people I interviewed have never talked to a newspaper reporter before. So what's going on in the mass media is about as lost on me as it is most of the people I uh, write about. But uh, with that apology aside, the idea of a sense of place in the news media uh, and in Appalachia interested me a lot. Uh, as far as my sense of place, my parents didn't agree too much about what they thought my place ought to be. My dad kind of visualized me working as a teller in the commercial bank at Mossboro and getting married to somebody that drove a truck or worked in the mines and living in a double wide house trailer with a Sears Craftsman fence around and two or three Dobermans in the yard. My mother, on the other hand, could any reason in the world why that after winning my two Pulitzer Prizes in journalism as a staff writer for the New York Times that I couldn't settle into writing a nationally syndicated column and then compiling my columns into hardcover books with my picture on the front course, uh, and give, give credit to my mother and then appearing regularly on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> so, so with those two uh, uh, images to work with, I decided I didn't think I'd last long in the trailer or in New York. So uh, 
I kind of tried to compromise, and what I wanted to do is uh, be a good journalist in eastern Kentucky and try to explain what was going on in eastern Kentucky from the point of view of an eastern Kentuckian, because the Lord knows in the 60s there's a, a whole bandwagon of journalists that came to Appalachia on this sort of uh, documentary pilgrimage, and uh, a lot of them didn't really understand too much about it, stayed long enough to get a story and left. Uh, so I'm ticked to death that I was able to find a job as a journalist at a paper that uh, I didn't have to suffer too much financially to work for. Anyway, thinking about Sense of Place in Appalachia, I've been writing, since I've been writing for the Herald Leader, I've written a story that was a real favorite of mine, and the more I thought about Professor Whitson's proposal, the more I thought that that Stinking Creek really fit in, what I learned on Stinking Creek really fit in with the idea of sense of place. So that's what I'm going to talk about, <laughs> ten minute introduction, but anyway, I'm going to talk about the six weeks that I spent reporting, another month or so I spent writing an article about Stinking Creek. You all probably remember the book, it was the one that uh, a Courier Journal reporter, John Fetterman, got into an awful lot of trouble about back in the 60s. This is it. I think it's kind of lost favor in the academic community, or maybe it never did have any favor. I don't know, but it, uh, Fetterman was a pretty formidable journalist. He won two Pulitzer Prizes for reporting on Eastern Kentucky. And um, the reason I wanted to do this story dates back to my early days as a student at that great blue university in the sky. Uh, I, I was working uh, on a government program. You know, we people from Appalachia have a, a real ability to get signed up on their programs, and I did too. And I was working in the reserve book section of the Margaret I. King Library. One day, this fine, upstanding young Yankee walked up to me and said that she wanted to take out a book called Stinking Creek. So I got it off the shelf for her and, and asked her if she'd sign and date your card. And, and uh, she looked at me when I spoke to her. She looked at me like she had just comprehended infinity or something. And she said, are you from Appalachia? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm from Bell County. And, and, <laughs> and, and so she kind of pushed the book back across the counter and said, I think you need this more than I do. <laughs> and so immediately I despised both John Fetterman and his book. Uh, so, you know, years pass and the, and the pages fly off the calendar and I'm a 30-year-old journalist working for the Herald Leader and an editor came up to me and asked me what topic I'd like to write about. If I could write on any topic and, and time was no object, what would I like to write about? And I told him I'd like to uh, find out what happened to the people who were reported on during the War on Poverty <coughs> and try to measure the success of the War on Poverty by finding those people. Now that's what I told him I was wanting to do. What I really wanted to do was to be the great uh, drawing avenger for all those people that had been uh, put down by John Fetterman, or at least in my mind they were. Uh, you've got to keep in mind I'm from Middlesbrough, and Middlesbrough is kind of the Athens of Eastern Kentucky. It's kind of the cultural hub of Eastern Kentucky, and I really didn't believe that there were people who live like this right here anywhere in Appalachia. So. Uh, so I was going to get revenge for those of us who lived in civilized society. Um, after six weeks on the creek, I concluded that Mr. Fetterman was probably more accurate about what he depicted as the 60s in rural Appalachia than I had thought he was. An awful lot of people on Stinking Creek though, really didn't like his book. And I think the core of the reason why they didn't is that he violated their sense of place. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I asked people what they didn't like about the book, almost universally, they didn't like a segment of the book about a hog breeding session. Uh, there was an elderly man and a few young boys who watched and commented on the breeding of a sow. And uh, everybody hated that. Everybody hated it. And they swore that nobody, uh, Fetterman quotes them using the dreaded F word, the dreaded F four letter word that cannot be repeated in public, but <coughs> anyway, he, uh, uh, everybody swore that nobody said that word on Stinking Creek. That word was not in the vocabulary of Stinking Creek. But after I stayed there a while, a few finally admitted that not only was that word in the vocabulary, but it was in fact used regularly at sessions such as the one that Mr. Fetterman had used. And so I think they just didn't expect to see that in a book. To the people of Stinking Creek, Fetterman had pretended that he was one of them, that he belonged. And then he, he betrayed everything they said to an uncomprehending outside world. Of course, that's what a journalist does for a living. 
I interviewed this one right here. Uh, this house is still here. This rock is still here, and this girl is still here. She's about my age. Um, she said to me, if he would have come back here, he would have got it. She said, he sat right down at their tables and ate and then wrote about them like that. And she, she really has a, a haunting resemblance to this picture, by the way. She looks very much like this picture. She wouldn't allow us to photograph her, and she was sort of reluctant to be interviewed. Another guy, M.D. Brown, who was feeding the story I wrote back in March, uh, said Fetterman didn't care if he hurt people, he just put things in. Earl Broughton, who Fetterman described as a young man who commuted back and forth from Cincinnati to support his family of seven children on Stinking Creek, uh, told me there was no way he wanted to comment on anything about that book. He said that uh, and he had driven 240 miles every weekend to see his family and then go back to work in Cincinnati. He was doing it at the time Fetterman wrote the book in 67, and he continued to do it till 1979 when he became ill and retired. He told me, he said, they made people look ignorant. Uh, the people on Stinking Creek's sense of place was very specific. Uh, Fetterman was from Danville originally and had worked in Kentucky all his life, but he sure didn't belong. He sure wasn't a Stinking Creeker. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think another objection that they felt is that maybe they felt he didn't understand the distinction that Stinking Creek was really several places and that every place was different. Knox Countyans hated this book because they thought that it saddled them with the image of Stinking Creek. And Stinking Creek, it's, it's this old distinction between the town boys and the head of the holler boys. You know, the, there's a, a, a sort of a, a prejudice between the people who live in the county seat town and the people who live out in the county. And the people in Barberville did not identify with the people on Stinking Creek. Now, on Stinking Creek itself, the people of Middle Fork were offended because they didn't appreciate being associated with the people on Brown's Branch. Uh, for example, I interviewed a fellow who I didn't quote, named Harold Bargo. He was in the book mentioned as a, he was in his late teens when the book was written. He's now a state police detective with special investigations. And he said that there were a lot of pretty girls on Brown's Branch, but you just didn't bring one home. They said it was a real guess who's coming to dinner scenario if you ever suggested uh, dating a girl from Brown's Branch. Um, another girl that was photographed, Fetterman, she wasn't mentioned too much, but she was photographed, was Monica Mills Bays. And she was 13. And what she said, now she lived on Middle Fork, the, the upper crust area of Stinking Creek. And she said, it seemed like they showed the worst houses. I know there were a lot of nice houses here then. Now, Fed described uh, Peggy Kenner and Irma Gall as do-gooders who were leading the war on poverty. In the book, uh, Irma was a school teacher, and Peggy Kenner was a nurse who had uh, come to Stinking Creek to try to improve uh, life there. They're still there, and they're certainly admired by the community, but I don't think they've really been accepted in community. They're still not, after 30-some years down there, they're still not, they're still not Stinking Creekers. Um, they, they're praised by people there, but they're really not accepted as a peer. Now, the praise that Linda Hand, which is the center they founded, gets is meted out much more slowly for, this, for the government programs that have been, uh, been in effect since Fetterman wrote his book. Most people won't badmouth anybody that try to help them, uh, but I think the homes along Stinking Creek are really a testament to the conflicting goals of government assistance programs. Uh, federal and state programs each ha seem to have a parade of per specific personalities and demands and they appeared and retreated as the news media would write about hunger or housing or medical care or heating or and, and it seems like every time a new topic came up there was a fresh crop of uh, sort of a new battalion of do-gooders to uh, implement and attack this problem. I'll give you some examples. This fellow we met named George Rourke and his family qualify for an energy assistance program that's uh, run out of Frankfurt. It means that he gets an allotment of coal, which he uses to fire his stokomatic uh, in the living room of his home on Pigeon Roost. The local social insurance office asks people to fill out forms to see if they qualify for this program. But once they qualify, they're served on a first-come, first-served basis. So in order to get a good place in line, the Roarks loaded up at 2.30 in the morning and were at the courthouse in Barberville by 3 a.m. 
They weren't the only people there at that hour. So I, of course, I asked him what he thought about the, the government making such an extraordinary requirement to sign up for energy assistance when they had, in fact, determined that he was uh, eligible for it. He shook his head and he said, if you want any coal, you're going to have to be in line to get it. Government workers decided that rather than slim grubs, home would be better if it were insulated. And this was part of a big federal program also. Now, the grubs had already insulated their home themselves. Uh, they had put newspapers on the walls, and then they had put wallpaper on top of the newspapers. But uh, the government came in and, and had this sort of blow-in insulation. I'm sure you've seen that. Well, over the years, uh, since this insulation program, the weight of the insulation has pushed against the newspaper and wallpaper so that now the ceiling is hanging in enormous billows and the walls are bulging, sort of like you get when you start getting fat. There's a sort of a drop bulge. Uh, that's what their walls and ceilings look like. Uh, otherwise, the grub home is exactly the way it was before they blew the insulation in. The front room has two beds and a dresser, and then there are chairs arranged around a, a, a fireplace there, so that they really only heat one room. They use that room to sleep in and, and also to sit in, and uh, their uh, interior door to their house is a is a big spool with a long nail driven through it. In other words, if the idea of the program was to try to push people to start improving their homes, at least I think it worked for the grubs. They took what was offered by the program and thank you very much and that was it. Myrtle Brown is another person who was uh, written about in Stinking Creek. She's a widow of Dewey Brown who uh, was picture five of the nine children they have. Uh, in, in Fetterman's book. Now, shortly after the book was written, her husband died, but she still lives there in the house. That, in fact, it's the house that's pictured on the front cover here. It looks as it did, except that uh, she's added a front porch, and then she's added an extension, and some government programs put uh, sheetrock up on the walls so that it's not rough board anymore, it's sheetrock. And we floored her house, and then they nailed this underskirting, like you see on mobile homes, around the edge of her house. Uh, she has taken the initiative to go, go ahead and build a, an extension onto her building, but the extension is of no better quality than the house she was living in to start with. But she's, you know, she was grateful for what the government had done. She said, it was a help to me. It looks better on the inside, though, than it does on the side, and the inside is where the government did all the work. I thought what had changed on Stinking Creek and what we wrote about was uh, opportunity. We felt like there was a significant difference in the ability to do something other than live on Stinking Creek if you wanted to. And we thought there were two ways in which opportunity was manifest. One was road improvements. Um, the road, getting to Stinking Creek wasn't bad when Fetterman wrote his book. A lot of the side roads have been improved. A lot of the bridges have been improved. School buses can drive to any child's home or within walking distance of any child's home so that uh, Road movements are, are, have, have uh, definitely improved the lifestyle there. And also schools. Uh, I don't think there are any one-room schools on Stinking Creek anymore. And certainly the physical plant, the schools, has improved. These two items were people mentioned. They're the most noticeable items to an outsider, but they're also the things that people mentioned to me that they appreciated the most. Uh, I interviewed a fellow named Jack Brown, who was one of the little boys in hog breeding thing. He was one of the little boys who helped unload the hog. And uh, he said that when he went to a consolidated elementary school at DeWitt, which is a near Stinking Creek, uh, that a teacher noticed that he had an ability in art that encouraged him to try to pursue uh, some creative avenues. He worked for a graphics company for a while and then decided to try to become a hairdresser and a country music singer. Now, he's still sort of aspiring, but he's certainly not living the kind of lifestyle he lived on Stinking Creek. Many of the people I interviewed for the book, such as uh, Kenneth Messer and Monica Mills and Peggy Mills and Judy Warren and Christine Brown, they all left Stink Creek and they all came back. And in almost every case, it was not to their financial advantage to come back. I just think that each person, uh, in his own way, had been pulled back by something that they couldn't get in the northern industrial suburbs where they had lived, and that was a place where they felt at home. I dislike the word, but it's often said that I'm a crusader. I don't think I'm any more of a crusader than any of you are. 
I just happened to have been raised in a county where I knew because I saw the canceled checks and talked to my mother personally about the fact that she had to pay $25 a year or 50 a year to the school superintendent to keep her teaching job. And with that kind of background and me being the editor of the local paper, I wound up in a lot of trouble trying to expose those kinds of things and stop them. And I, I suppose I've done both to some extent. <clears throat> I've come here to talk to you about today is something that uh, all of us harbor in our hearts, I think, or at least I certainly have. I've always had the feeling that the world picks on us, being from eastern Kentucky especially, and I have lots of reasons to feel that way, and I've made my newspaper a product that speaks every week to that stereotype and tries to show that it's incorrect. I knew I first had a problem with the world understanding me when I was, uh, I guess, about a freshman in college and went to Chicago every summer to make oranges as a summer job. Uh, and up there, they, they had a saying that if there were any more hillbillies down there wanting jobs and we have openings, we'd like to hire you because they knew we were all hard workers. So I knew I didn't, I always had the feeling I never had anything to feel ashamed of. But one day, a little girl was driving by her tricycle as I sat in my car on a hot day in Chicago. I said hi as she went by on her tricycle, and she said hi as she went by. The next time through, I thought she offered friendly, and I said, where do you live? And she said, I'm down here. And she said, where do you live? And I said, Kentucky. She said, where is that? And I told, she said, what country is that in? <laughs> well, I told her she wasn't old enough yet to know the difference of, of your states, I suppose. Then she said something that stuck with me ever since. She said, what language do you speak? <laughs> and I knew that I had a twang, uh, but, and I tried to work on that too, although I've learned since it's all right to have that twang, and I'm, I'm not a bit ashamed of it. Um, they asked me to ascribe a title to my talk today, and I thought, I don't know, uh, I've yet to write a speech. They said, be sure and write one and give us copies in advance. Well, I wrote these notes on the way down in my car as I steered my Honda with my left and wrote with the right, so forgive me if none of this makes sense. But I say it often, and it's kind of done by rote now. I think Eastern Kentuckians are, are not only proud people as we know them, but excellent stock. Harry Collis says we have a gene problem. Well, thoroughbreds in Lexington are sold for millions of dollars for just keeping their stock pure. And I think that's what we're doing in the mountains, if anything at all. Uh, <laughs> um, as <clears throat> the title of my talk, I told them, would be, uh, I'm a lovely Kentuckian. And I am, and I have a zip code to prove that. It's 41231, lovely Kentucky. Now, I grew up there thinking that I was a special person. I lived in a town called Lovely. <coughs> and never mind that there was a little dirt about, we were quite proud of our place. And then I was, uh, I knew I was living in a, uh, a sort of heaven because in my county, the, the county seat in the early days was called Eden. And then Luck Beauty was three miles down the road. Um, I like to tell you a story, and this is, I wrote it down as Judy was talking. A story about Tom Fletcher. That name may be a ghost of the past to some of you, but most of you probably don't know the name at all. Remember Lyndon Johnson came to Kentucky and to Inez and to Martin County. Inez is 10 miles from Lovely to launch the war on poverty. And he said he was going to whip poor, poverty, and he was going to start by doing it in Ice, Kentucky. He came there because we were said to be the poorest all-white county in America. Well, we didn't know we were poor until he came and told us. <laughs> Had no idea what poverty was. We were happy and unknowing that we didn't have a lot of money, but we may do what we had. I grew up knowing people who made their own soap. My mother was one of those, and who built their own house, and who fixed their own car, and who were otherwise self-sufficient. And that's something that a lot of people in this world say. And I like to write about those kinds of things. But Tom Fletcher was that broken poor man that Lyndon Johnson came to visit. Now, I've been to see Tom several times since the president came. And there's two things I've learned. Number one is he hates all reporters. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And number two, that the visit by LBJ did him no good. When I visit his house, he makes me promise not to write about it, and I've always stuck to that promise. I'd love to put it in a book someday that I promise I'm going to write for, for after 10 years of threat to do it. I, I can't seem to figure out how to write each week about my town and what goes on and write a book, too. But Tom Fletcher told me this incredible story just last December when one of those big city reporters came down from New York and said, take me to see Tom. It's happened a few dozen times through the years, and Tom's always sent them out of town. Uh, I promised Tom, and he did too, that we'd leave our notebooks in the car, and he let us on in on a snowy dust winter. And he told us the story the first time I'd ever heard it about LBJ's visit. And I asked him, did the president give you a, a watch? No. Did he write you a letter thanking you for being so hospitable? No. And he told the story about LB, LBJ's visit this way. He was out in the backyard, roofing his, getting ready to go on the roof again to put a new roof on his house. And the sheriff walked around the house. He was in his dirty old T-shirt. And the sheriff walked around the house and said, hey, Tom, there's somebody here to see you. And he said, who is it? And he said, it's the president of the United States. <laughs> well, that ought to be enough to make anybody turn and run. But Tom did the right thing. He walked around the house to a pool of White House reporters pointing their cameras at Tom. And suddenly he appeared on the cover of news on the cover of Life. It was on every front page in the country practically, and he hates reporters. <laughs> and I don't blame him. I'm on Tom's side with that. And there is a stereotype about Appalachia, and I think we ought to do something about it. You know, there's the NAACP. It speaks eloquently for misdeeds perpetrated upon blacks. We need something, and on the way down in my herd, as I rounded the curve. I wrote down the initials ATS, for lack of something better. But let's call our little group the Appalachian Truth Society, and let's insist that they'll tell the truth about people from Appalachia. And let's not let those hee-haw shows go unprotested. <laughs> and let's not let the Beverly Hillies be the spokesman for Appalachians.